Welcome back. There was a sister up here in between, and she was wanting me to get to the punchline. <laughs> and I'm, I'm telling you, we're heading towards the punchline. But unfortunately, I'm not going to feel comfortable when we get there that we did put enough planks in place. But believe it or not, I think we're going to start pulling these things together for you here in the near future. <laughs> um, in Revelation 17... Verse 3, John is carried into the wilderness, and based upon Revelation 12, verses 6 and 14, the wilderness is the 1260 years of dark ages. Please test this for yourself. Also notice that after John is carried to the wilderness, um, in verses 4 through 6, when he sees the woman upon the beast, he describes the woman upon the beast. I know that you were all familiar with this passage. I'm not going to read it because I'm trying to get to the punchline. But if you remember, the woman, you can read it, she's drunk with the blood of the saints. And we get drunk after we drink. So when John is carried to the wilderness, when John is carried to the Dark Ages in order to see the papacy, he's not simply carried to the middle or the beginning of the 1260 years. He's carried to the very end of the 1260 years, of papal rule because the woman has already persecuted. She's already drunk with the blood of the saints. Typically, we take a little bit of time here to point out that 25 years before 1798, the persecution ceased. Sister White speaks about this. Christ spoke about this. When Christ said in Matthew 24, except those days should be shortened, Sister White comments on that statement at least three times, probably more, where she identifies those days as the Dark Ages and then points out that 25 years before 1798, the persecution ceased. So if John was carried to the Dark Ages to see the woman, and she was already drunk with the blood of the saints, and he's right there down at the end of the 1260-year time period. Now, brothers and sisters, every fact has its bearing. One of the first things that Revelation 17 does for us as students of prophecy is it says, hey, you need to understand that John is placed at this point in history in order to unravel the mystery of five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, and is the eighth is of the seven. If you put him in the wrong place in history... Whatever has fallen and is and is yet to come is going to be different at that point in history. And I say whatever because there's disagreements about what these kings are. But let's look at them. I'm going to tell you what they are. I'm not, I don't have time to defend my position fully. But in verse 10, it says, and there are seven kings. Verse 10 of Revelation 17. I'm saying that when John was carried to the 1798 time period, he then is told that there's seven kings. I know that I passed over the description of the beast. This presentation is on the prophecy school, 40-hour prophecy school. I think it's probably on the Idaho and Blythe as well. Um, for me, when it says there are seven kings, I stick with the basics of Daniel and Revelation, where um, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, are the head of gold. A king in Bible prophecy is a kingdom. Verse 10 is saying, and there are seven kingdoms. And over and over again, Sister White says, the books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. We read a quote early on, I think Friday night, where Sister White says the same line of prophecy that is in the book of Daniel is taken up in the book of Revelation. The, the, same, the same point of reference, therefore I stick with the kingdoms of Bible prophecy that we all know that are identified in the book of Daniel which begin with Babylon. So what I'm suggesting is, <clears throat> there are seven kings. The first is Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, John is carried to history, to right here, 1798. And he's told, five are fallen. The five that are fallen are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. One is. I understand the argument that takes place about the one is. I reject the argument that this is atheistic France. I have many reasons for doing so, but I'm simply going to tell you that the kingdom of Bible prophecy that is in existence in 1798 is the USA. 
Um, the seventh, by the literary structure of Revelation 17, who, 17, whoever the seventh kingdom is, it is the ten kings. Um, when it's speaking of the ten kings, it says they have received no kingdom as of yet. It is the kingdom that has not yet come. And the seventh kingdom in verse 10, it says, and the other has not yet come. Five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. If you are very careful with the structure of Revelation 17, no matter who you identify the ten kings as, they have to be the seventh kingdom. And then the eighth is of the seven, and, uh, which means that whoever the eighth is, it's got to be one of these. And I, I'd submit to you just for time that this is the papacy. It's of the seven. It's the fifth. It's the one of the seven that has received a deadly wound. And in Bible prophecy, the number eight represents resurrection. Uh, prophetically, Christ was resurrected on the, the eighth day. Um, boys are to be circumcised on the eighth day. Circumcision is a sign of baptism. Baptism is a sign of resurrection. Um, eight people got on the ark, went from the old world to the new world, resurrection. Uh, so the power, the eighth is of the seven. It's the power that received the deadly wound. It's resurrected. The point I was making about verse 1 is this, um, that if you're going to rightly discern this formula here, that you have to do it in connection with Revelation 16. And the angel that brought this message is one of the angels that will pour out the seven last plagues in Revelation 16. And one of the most important truths in Revelation 16 is that modern Babylon comes in three parts, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. So with that consideration, and I'm, I'm moving over a lot of proof texts. I'm, I'm trying to make one point, so forgive me that I'm not proving these points. With that consideration, what I'm suggesting is, is that these are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, but in reality, Revelation 17 is teaching us how the sixth and final kingdom comes together. This is the sixth kingdom, and it's made up of the United States, the false prophet. The beast, the papacy, and the dragon, the United Nations. Now, in, in the three Elijahs, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> Elijah the first had to deal with the threefold power. Jezebel, an impure woman, an impure church. That's the papacy. The papacy, Jezebel. The book of Revelation plainly tells us that the papacy is represented by Jezebel. Okay, so the, all the prophets agree with each other. 1 Corinthians 14, 32. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion. The, the story of Elijah is not going to contradict with the story of Revelation 17. And in the story of Elijah, God's people deal with a threefold enemy. And Revelation 16 says the threefold enemy is the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And we're suggesting that you need to, to understand Revelation 17 in connection with Revelation 16. So Revelation 17, more than anything else, is telling us how this final kingdom of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet comes together. And when you incorporate the testimony of Elijah into it, you see that the beast, the papacy, is Jezebel, the deceiving power. The prophets of Baal tried to deceive the people by doing the dance of deception around their offering, just as the daughter of Herodias did a dance of deception for Herod and his guests. One of the powers is the deceiving power, and Revelation 13 is very clear that it's the USA that is the deceiving power. It's the one that does the dance of deception. The story of Elijah, its contribution to end-time Bible prophecy is it tells us the, the specific characteristics of these three powers. One is an impure woman, an impure church. One is the power that deceives. And then the other is Ahab. It's Herod. It's a king. It's a civil power. And that's what Revelation 17 is all about, about the woman marrying, committing fornication with the kings of the earth. It's this unholy relationship, which we understand in Bible prophecy, is the combination of church and state. Herod and Ahab represent the state power, their kings, their kingdom, their un the United Nations. And there is a statement in Testimonies to Ministers. You, you look it up. It's, it's there. It says this. 
kings, governors, and rulers. And, and it says that. And the reason I want to make a point on this, it's a plurality. It doesn't say a king or a governor. It says kings, governors, and rulers, a plurality of people, have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon that goes to make war with the saints. So Sister White tells us that the dragon power that brings the persecution at the end of the world against God's people is a group of political figures, kings, governors, and rulers. That's consistent with these ten kings. Okay, They are the civil power. And... They're the United Nations. This is the impure church. This is the deceiving power. IRE for deceive. Let's put deceiver. So anyway, that's the three powers. And you can bring, and we do this in the prophecy school. In, the, in our prophecy school, when we're going through this, we have a board that sets their stationary. And we start developing this threefold power through the scriptures. And you can bring line after line of prophetic testimony upon who these three enemies are at the end of the world. But brothers and sisters, the three enemies at the end of the world are the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. The dragon power is the civil structure that comes together with the papacy. It's the ten kings. The United States fulfills the role of the deceiving power. <clears throat> one thing that seems interesting to me, when you understand that Revelation 17 is giving the correct sequence, it all unfolds in the correct sequence, but when you understand that it's not actually telling us about the 6th, 7th, and 8th kingdom of Bible prophecy, but it's telling us how the final kingdom of Bible prophecy comes together, and the final kingdom of Bible prophecy is threefold, then you realize that these three are simply one-third each of the sixth and final kingdom of Bible prophecy. So the United States, in that sense, is the sixth kingdom, the United Nations is the sixth kingdom, and the papacy is the sixth kingdom. And there's, there's much to be said about that, but here's, here's where I want to get to. Because we're talking about Islam, believe it or not. Okay, Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 17. Speaking of the ten horns. Verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. And we're suggesting that's the United Nations. Uh, which have received no kingdom as yet. Remember, the seventh kingdom had not yet come. But receive power as kings one hour with the beast. When the United Nations is empowered, it is going to... Um, continue for a short space. If you look at verse 10, it says, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. The other that is not yet come is the seventh kingdom. And it says of this seventh kingdom, And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. This seventh kingdom is only going to be around for a short period of time. And then when it's dealing with this seventh kingdom in verse 12, it says this seventh kingdom, these ten kings that they rule for one hour with the beast, for a short space, short period of time, but they co-rule. Look at verse um, 17. For, speaking of the ten kings, it says, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God be fulfilled. These ten kings, they receive their kingdom, but only in the sense that when... The world agrees to let them rule the world. They have to agree to co-rule with the papacy. They're going to rule with the beast for one hour, for a short space. And that's what Bible prophecy teaches over and over again. Revelation 13 upholds this. Daniel 11 upholds this. Um, that at the end of the world, the United States is going to force the world to accept, accept a one-world government in which the civil structure is the United Nations and the moral authority that sets upon the civil structure is the Pope of Rome. Now, in the story of Elijah, <clears throat> the civil power in both stories is deceived. Jezebel's intentions that King Ahab did not understand is that Jezebel wanted to kill Elijah no matter what. 
It didn't matter what happened at Carmel. Jezebel still wanted to kill Elijah, correct? But, but Ahab didn't understand that. After he seen what went on at Carmel, and he goes back to, to Jezebel, he says, you won't believe what happened. Elijah's God is the God of heaven. And she says, Elijah's going to be dead by tomorrow. Was Ahab expecting that response from Jezebel? See, he was deceived. Now, Ahab is just prefiguring Herod. When Herod says to Salome, up to half my kingdom I'll give you for that wonderful dance, did he think that Salome was going to say, what I want is John the Baptist's head and a charger? No, no. See, there's a, in both stories, there is a deception that is identified that the, the civil power is deceived to the motivations of the impure woman to Jezebel. Okay, it's there. Therefore, it's going to happen at the end of the world. So what is the deception? You can already see it being played out, brothers and sisters. Once you see this story and you start watching history, you can see it played out. I'll give you an example of it. When Saddam Hussein was first captured, there was an argument that went on on planet Earth. And the argument was, do you try Saddam Hussein in the United States or in Iraq? Or do you try, try him in the world court? Either the United States or Iraq or the world court. The United States and Iraq, they believe in the death penalty. The world court doesn't believe in the death penalty. The world court is the court of the United Nations. Okay? So there was an argument in the world. Are we going to try him in the world court because we don't believe in the death penalty? Or are we going to try him where we believe in the death penalty? In that argument that went on, if you remember, the Pope of Rome began to send out letters. And what did he say? We're in agreement with the United Nations. We do not believe in the death penalty. The Pope doesn't believe in the death penalty. <laughs> the, the, the United Nations, has all, the, the, the groundwork has already been laid. The United Nations has been led to believe that the Pope doesn't believe in the death penalty. It's a public record. It's happened in, in, our, in our recent lifetime. So, this history of 533, brothers and sisters, it's repeated in our day and age. Because in 533, the civil power was given to the papacy. Revelation 13, 2 says the dragon, pagan Rome, gave three things to the papacy. Power, seat, and authority. The power represents the military and economic strength of the seven European kings that was used to remove the Heroli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Daniel 7. They continued to give that strength to the papacy all the way through the Dark Ages, but from 496 to 508, that's where the initial giving took place. That's where they gave their power to the papacy. They gave their seat to the papacy in the year 330, when Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople, and the papacy assumed the, the power position in the city of Rome, and it's been seated there ever since, and it's seated there to the very end. But in the year 533, the civil authority was given to the papacy. And the history of Justinian giving the civil authority to the papacy is this. The kingdom's falling apart. The, the trumpets are blowing. The trumpets are blowing. The forces that are bringing the Roman Empire to its knees got a political crisis going on, but there's a religious crisis too. The religious crisis then is... Who's the head of the churches, the church in Constantinople or the church in Rome? And in the midst of that situation, Justinian determines that it's best for him to give the civil authority to the Pope of Rome. He didn't think, he didn't realize, I don't believe he realized he was giving the civil authority to him, but he, in actuality he did. Because the Pope can turn to him then and say, you're the heretic, off with your head. At the end of the world, brothers and sisters, there's going to be two crises that it's confronting the world. The world is going to be falling apart through the activities of the seventh trumpet, the third woe. Once again, the woes are bringing the kingdom to its knee. And the seventh trumpet is Islam, which is also the religious crisis. And the religious crisis the world is confronted with is radical Islam or acceptable, or let me, let me state it this way, is there one part of Islam that's acceptable and one that isn't? We know radical Islam is not acceptable for what they're doing. Is there, is there a portion of Islam, though, that is moderate, that is acceptable? 
Well, we can't let the United States make that decision. You know, George Bush is a cowboy. You can't trust George Bush. You may not believe that here in the United States, but that's what the world believes. And I mean, I've traveled around the world. <laughs> that's what they believe. Uh, I think that's probably pretty much what I believe, too. <laughs> but uh, I, the, the point is, is the world is not going to accept the United States to be the one that decides which part of Islam is acceptable and which isn't. And the world isn't going to want the United Nations to do it either because the United Nations doesn't do anything, all right, except, you know, scam money from the system for themselves. They're just ineffective. Everyone knows it. But, brothers and sisters, the greatest moral leader in the world today, we can trust him to make that decision between, you know, this portion of Islam and that portion of Islam. So, brothers and sisters, what we're suggesting is, is that in the first woe, Islam was to hurt the armies of Rome, and in the second woe, it was to kill the armies of Rome. It's an escalation of warfare that's brought against the armies of Rome, and the armies of Rome at the end of the world is none other than the United States of America. And that escalating strife symbolized as an angry horse about to break loose upon the world, the winds of strife, they escalate, and as they escalate, they provide the environment in the United States to pass a Sunday law. We haven't spent t much time on the Sunday law, but it's after the Sunday law that the United States goes out to the world and tells them that they have to come under the umbrella of a one-world government. Islam doesn't slow down. It continues to escalate. In this time period, the world is convinced that the only way to deal with Islam is to bring the world under the umbrella of a one-world government and allow the Pope of Rome to be the moral authority that decides which branch of Islam is acceptable and which isn't. And Sister White says, all the Pope is waiting for is vantage ground. When this agreement is struck, Ahab and Herod are going to find that they've been deceived about the Pope's motivations and intentions on two fronts. They didn't think he wanted the death penalty, and they thought he was going to deal with Islam but he's not going to deal with Islam. He's going to deal with Adventism. Brothers and sisters, it's, it's already unfolding in our time period. It's already taken place. And what brings this situation about is the angering of the nations, the winds of strife, the third woe. It's radical Islam. And it isn't an accident what, or a coincidence or just... An insignificant event. On 9-11-2001, the world came together through the, the pushing of George Bush to decide the fate of Islam. That's what it's all about. And suddenly, we've reached a point in history where August 11th, 1840 has been paralleled. There's more to be said about that. There's more arguments on Islam. There's more arguments on Islam. Time doesn't allow us to go there. I now want to begin looking at Revelation 18. <clears throat> you know, there was a question early on this week and I, just a brief discussion with a brother. I don't even remember which brother it was. <clears throat> maybe it was two different discussions. But let me tell you something how I understand it. And maybe I'm incorrect on this one. Is prophecy, brothers and sisters, prophecy is not doctrine. Amen. It's never been intended to be doctrine. Okay, Prophecy is the unfolding of truth that Christ accomplishes to his people at certain points of history. Prophecy is not doctrine. All right? And it, you need to think that one through because I'm certain that that's correct. And once you see the difference between prophecy and doctrine, it, it, it opens some windows into your understanding. Somewhere along the line in Adventism, in the history of Adventism, we turned prophecy into a doctrine. When we do our evangelism, uh, we can go to evangelistic series, and generally when a Seventh-day Adventist is doing an evangelistic series, he's going to tell you the, 
the basics of Daniel 2, the basics of Daniel 7, the basics of Daniel 8, and it's correct. And, and they don't want to tread on Daniel 11. So they go ahead and they jump into Revelation 12. They don't, they don't deal with the seals and the trumpets much anymore, do they? They jump into Revelation 12 and they talk about the remnant and then they'll go into Revelation 13. And they're not going to really get into Revelation 17 too much. But what they teach is basically true. I'm not going to criticize them for being incorrect. But what we've done, when we go to those evangelistic series and we sit there, we, we hear what they're saying on Daniel 7 and we say, yes, that's how I understand it. What they're saying on Daniel 2, that's how I understand it. We've turned prophecy into a doctrine. Prophecy isn't a doctrine. And what I'm suggesting to you here before we move further on into this subject is I want to point something out. When you finally are confronted with the fact that the United Nations, Islam, the United States, and the papacy are clearly identified in end-time Bible prophecy and their relationship to one another and the things that they will do are clearly laid out in Bible prophecy, then you realize that you have an evangelistic message like none other on planet Earth because you know what's happening with Islam and the United Nations and the papacy and the United States. So when we're looking at this message, I believe this message is for Seventh-day Adventists. It's to wake, awaken us to our condition that we are unprepared for the events that are about to take place and that we need to be prepared fully so that the Holy Spirit can empower us to take the message to the world. But the message is the message that identifies exactly what's going on on planet Earth today. And if you can tell me that you can open a newspaper or turn on your TV and not recognize that the main issue in the papers and the newspaper is Islam, then, then you're not watching the same TV and reading the same newspaper that everyone else is. Brothers and sisters, that's what's going on. And what I'm suggesting is that prophecy is very clear about what's going on. We have the message. And this message is in agreement with the pioneer understanding doesn't challenge their understanding. It builds upon their understanding. Oh, there's some new stuff in it. No doubt about it. We're forced to think things through differently than maybe we have for our Adventist experience. But brothers and sisters, it's time to wake up, bring our life into agreement where we can understand these things in such an intelligent fashion that we can begin to proclaim them to the world, not as a doctrine, but as a living reality. Now is probably not the time. Uh, I'm on a time schedule here, and I have to move into Revelation 18. We have a brother wanting to write a question, and I know him well enough that I can tell him now is not the time. Uh, Revelation 18. Manuscript uh, releases, volume 13. You're going to raise your hand higher. Okay, maybe now is the time. Oh, if it's a short question, I can repeat it. It's, it's a point. It's a point. Is it That's a short right. question? There was something going on. It was the first angel's message. This is the time. We are the people. But you have to have the experience with the message. Because the first angel's message is born again. The Sabbath experience sealed in God. So you can cast out fear to give the second and third angel's message. Which the world is afraid to give. And unconverted people are afraid to give. So that's the message. Born again, and then you can be called of God give the message. Yeah, I agree with you. But I would express that a different way, a little bit outside the scope of this presentation, but I'll, I'll go there for all of us here because I think it's a valid point. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis 15. <clears throat> Genesis 3, I'm sorry, 3, verse 15. Um, Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise thy heel. This is a pronouncement against Satan. It is the first illustration of the gospel in the word of God. Uh, this contains all the components of the gospel. If you carefully dissect it, it, it's all there. I mean, Jones and Wagner used to do this. They would take this verse, and they could do sermon after sermon on this verse. This is the everlasting gospel. And the gospel promises that it's going to put a hatred and enmity between uh, the descendants of Satan and the descendants of Christ, to keep it simple. That's what the gospel does. It brings division. 
All right? The Millerites proclaimed the everlasting gospel. That was the first angel's message. They proclaimed it. We all understand that. But what we sometimes forget to remember is as they were proclaiming the everlasting gospel, they experienced it. That is what's illustrated in this history. This is one of the most important points of this history. From 1840 to 1844, not only did the Millerites proclaim the everlasting gospel, they experienced it, because when they get to October 22nd, 1844, the Millerite movement is fractured. On the 21st, there's 50,000 followers. On the 23rd, there's 49,950 foolish virgins and only 50 wise virgins. And the 50 wise virgins have followed Christ into the most holy place. And the 49,950 foolish virgins are sending their prayers to Satan, according to Sister White. The everlasting gospel had been experienced as well as proclaimed. So as we proceed into this study and we try to nail down the nuts and bolts about how this history is repeating as we speak, remember, it's not simply the proclamation of this message that takes place during this time period. The identical process of purification takes place because if there's ever a time in sacred history when the everlasting gospel is experienced, it's experienced in the time period when the 144,000 are developed and that's the process that is underway today. Manuscript releases, volume 13, page 334. I stated that I was a stockholder and could not let the resolution pass. That there was to be special light for God's people as they neared the closing scenes of this earth's history. Another angel was to come from heaven with a message and the whole earth was to be lightened with his glory. It would be impossible for us to state just how this additional light would come. It might come in a very unexpected manner, in a way that would not agree with the ideas that many had conceived. It is not at all unlikely or contrary to the ways and works of God to send light to his people in unexpected ways. The Sister White here is saying that at the end, when it comes time for the angel of Revelation 18 to come down, there will be special light for us, and that it may come in a way that you and I don't expect. I mean... We would hope that the special end time light would come through the covers of the Review and Herald magazine, right? Well, I mean, in reality, that's what we'd hope for. If, if you're saying no, then I don't, think you, I don't think you should say that. We should hope that the Seventh-day Adventist Church would fulfill its high and holy calling to the fullest sense. But this special light may come in another way, right? Um, But it's in connection here in this statement to Revelation 18. So what we're going to try to show you here is this. On August 11th, 1840, the four angels that had been loosed from the Euphrates River to bring warfare against Europe were restrained when the four great powers of Europe came together to decide the fate of Islam. And the first angel's message was empowered because the Millerites had predicted that event based upon the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. And because providentially they had prepared the Millerite tracts, printed them, and in 1840 they were already in the ports, in the ships on the east and west coast, ready to go to every mission station in the world. Historical fact. And when the world realized that what they were saying about the year-day principle was correct, William Miller's meetings went from this attendance of, you know, 50 to 100 to 1 or 2,000, 3,000 people because the world suddenly recognized, boy, it's serious what they're saying as they use this year-day principle. This all takes place in this fulfillment on August 11, 1840. The first angel's message is empowered. Another thing that takes place, brothers and sisters, And this is important to take note of. It is here 
that the mighty angel of Revelation 10 comes down out of heaven with the little book of Daniel open in his hand, and he puts one foot upon the land and one foot upon the sea, and Sister White says that represents the carrying of the message to the world. And the message was carried to the world in 1840. So one of the other components of this history is that at this point in time, a mighty angel comes down out of heaven, and it represents a worldwide message. Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 40. The whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of the Lord. The pure in heart shall see God. It is those who are following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth that will receive power from that angel that came down from heaven having great power. The first message is to be repeated, proclaiming the second advent of Christ to our world. The second angel's message is to be repeated. This history, brothers and sisters, Sister White says it in a variety of ways. It is to be repeated. How simple is that? It's going to be repeated. In, let's talk about the angels here. Uh, Selected Messages, Book 3, page 412. Why am I talking about the angels? When I, when I take more time to share the repeat of the Millerite history, we've read a quote twice at least here, or not read it, I've stated it, maybe read it once, where Sister White says, the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Advent people. And then in Review and Herald, August 19th, 1890, she says, this parable has been and will be repeated to the very letter. So, the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled in the Millerite time period to the very letter, and it's going to be fulfilled at the end of the world again to the very letter. But Sister White has told us when it comes to the parable of the ten virgins, what it's teaching is the experience of the Advent people. This line of prophecy in Matthew 25, it's the same line of t- prophecy that you'll find in, in Revelation 10, Revelation 14, and other places in Scripture. They're, they're all emphasizing the repeat of the Millerite history, but each of these lines of history is contributing a different aspect of truth. When it comes to the parable of the ten virgins, it's telling us what the experience of God's people is at that time. Revelation 10 is teaching the repeat of the Millerite history, but Sister White, speaking of, of Revelation 10, she says it's identifying the role that Christ plays in this history. Revelation 10 isn't so much emphasizing the experience of the Millerites and the experience of the 144,000. More than that, it's emphasizing the role of Christ. And when it comes to Revelation 14 and Revelation 18, which are also teaching the repeat of this history, the angels are the symbol here. And Sister White tells us that the angels represent the work that the people of God accomplish. It's not so much emphasizing the experience of the people of God, nor the part that Christ plays. Revelation 14 and 18 is talking about the work that is carried out. These lines of prophecy are the identical lines of prophecy, but it's when you bring them together one upon another, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that the picture gets bigger. And we need to understand that these different lines of prophecy are emphasizing different aspects of this history. Do you follow the point that I'm trying to make? Okay, so when it comes to the angels, that's why I'm going there. Selected Messages, Book 3. Page 412. Another angel is to come down from heaven. This angel represents the giving of the loud cry. It's the work, which is to come from those who are preparing to cry mightily with a strong voice. Um, 1888 Materials, page 926. John saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth, the whole earth was lightened with his glory. That work is the voice of the people of God proclaiming a message of warning to the world. So when we're suggesting that Revelation 14 and Revelation 18 are teaching a repeat of this history up here, what they're teaching us is the, is the, the repetition of the work. The different, not um, a contradiction, just another line that only um, increases our understanding. Um, so, let me read the Review and Herald, December 15th, 1885. The dust and rubbish of error have buried the precious jewels of truth, but the Lord's workers 
can uncover these treasures so that thousands will look upon them with delight and awe. Angels of God will be beside the humble worker, giving grace and divine enlightenment, and thousands will be led to pray with David, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Truths that have been for ages unseen and unheeded will blaze forth from the illuminated pages of God's holy word. The churches generally that have heard, refused, and trampled upon the truth will do more wickedly, but the wise, those who are honest, will understand. That's, that's to one of the most important definitions for me, brothers and sisters. It's outside the scope of this, but when you, when you realize that the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be repeated to the very letter and that it's identifying the experience of Adventism, then you start to grapple, well, what's, what makes me a foolish virgin or what makes me a wise virgin? And one of the things here that Sister White's saying is what makes a wise virgin a wise virgin is that they have an honest heart. And from my human experience, and I can't judge, that's what I see when people are willing to consider the prophetic word. It's those that have the honest heart. They're willing to take a look at it honestly and test it. But you have in your audience many times people that, you know, all they're there to do is to show why you're a heretic and why this isn't important to be studied and this, that, and the other. And you come away from, from the situation thinking, you know, there seems like there's some other motivation behind this person's reason for being here. And you question their honesty. Sister White says one of the characteristics of the wise, which all of us want to be, is that they're honest. That's not the point I'm trying to make here, though. The churches generally that have heard, refused, and trampled upon the truth will do more wickedly. But the wise, those who are honest, will understand. The book is open, and the words of God reach the hearts of those who desire to know his will. At the loud cry of the angel from heaven, who joins the third angels, thousands will awake from a stupor that has held them held the world for ages, and will see the beauty and value of truth. We're in the time period when thousands are about to wake up. What a blessed time to live in if you're walking with the Lord. What a horrible time to live in if you're not. Early Writings, page 277. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This message seemed to be an addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message. Please notice, Sister White saying that the midnight cry joins the second angel's message. That's one of the characteristics of the midnight cry, is that it joins the second angel's message, but... The third angel's message is joined by the fourth angel. Okay, she's making a parallel here. She's already said these, these messages are repeated, and, and this, is, this is the direction we're going at this time. Um, here's what we're suggesting. I'm, I'm, I'll try to prove it as we proceed. I'm not near there, there yet. Early writings, page 245, sorry. Um, this is kind of a tricky one to follow, I think. She's going to talk about the first angel's message and the second angel's message. I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going on upon earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel, this is the first angel's message, to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second appearing. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and to warn men of the coming wrath of God. Multitudes received the light. Another mighty angel, the second angel, was commissioned to descend to the earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing as he came to earth, and he cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. As the people of God united in the, sec in the cry of the second angel, the heavenly host marked with deep interest the effect of the message. Jesus commissioned other angels to fly quickly and revive and strengthen the drooping faith of his people and prepare them to understand the message of the second angel and the important move which was soon to be made in heaven. I saw these angels receive great power and light from heaven and light from Jesus. I saw these angels receive great power and light from Jesus and fly quickly to earth to fulfill their commission and aid the second angel in his work. A great light shone upon the people of God as they cried, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Now this is going to seem a little bit theoretical here, or, or something, probably. But Sister White here has just described the first angel's message as a singular angel. Then she describes the second angel's message as a singular angel. 
And then she describes the midnight cry as a plurality of angels. Midnight cry, he sent many angels. First angel, singular angel. Second angel's message, singular angel. Midnight cry, plurality of angels. I know that this is hard to follow if you, don't have, if you can't look at it, but it's there. Early Writings 277 says this. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to earth, and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel, singular, commissioned to descend to the earth and unite his voice with the third angel. So this mighty angel, this singular angel, this isn't the first angel. This is the fourth angel. This is the angel of Revelation 18 that's going to join with the third angel, right? That's what she said. Then I saw another mighty angel, singular, commissioned to descend to earth and unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel as he descended, and the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon is fallen. The message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated. With the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844, the work of this angel comes at the right time to join in the last work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation which they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them, and they united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. Angels, plural, angels, were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices, plural, Voices which seem to sound everywhere come out of her, my people. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 18. And we're going to look at something that you may not have considered before. And I want to at least suggest to you that we read a quote at the beginning here of our look at Revelation 18, where she says there will be special light in connection with Revelation 18 at the end. I understand that when we say Revelation 18 is the fourth angel's message, I understand it that it is the loud cry message, it is the latter rain message. I'm not arguing against any of those understandings in Adventism. But that's a general understanding of Revelation 18. If we are to get specific about Revelation 18, we will note something, that there are two different angels here mentioned. Look at Revelation 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul, and un foul spirit in the cage of un every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. And then in verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Now, in the quote we were just in the middle of, when I jumped over there, Sister White says, speaking of, of the fourth angel's message, she first mentions the fourth angel, singular. She says it joins with the third angel's message, singular. And then she says this, Angels, plural, were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices, plural, which seemed to say, sound everywhere, where, come out of her, my people. This is the other voice of Revelation 18, the other voice of verse 4. What am I saying? i got to tell you what I'm saying now because I'm getting too far out. got to pull it together and then we'll, we'll build upon it. Here's what we're suggesting. We're suggesting that this history is going to be repeated. Let me give you one quote. The 1888 materials, page 804. Mark this one down. <clears throat> 804 of the 1888 materials. The first and second angels' messages are still truth for this time and are to run parallel with, that which, with this which follows. The first and second angels' messages, here and here, are still present truth, but they will parallel that which follows. What follows the first and second angels' message? The third angels' message. So 
So here we are going to parallel the third angel's message with the first and second angel's message. Here's what we're suggesting, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> first angel's message was proclaimed by William Miller, but it wasn't empowered until 1840. Second angel's message arrives at this time, but it's not empowered until the midnight cry. The third angel's message, which follows the first and second, arrives in history on October 22, 1844, but it's not empowered until when? Until the fourth angel joins it. But what follows the first and second is to run parallel with it. So we're suggesting, just as William Miller began to proclaim his message in 1831, that the message of the third angel began to be proclaimed on October 22, 1844, Technically not then, they didn't quite understand it, but that's when it arrives in history. And it has been going through history, just as Miller's message did, but we know at some point in time the third angel's message is going to be empowered, just as Miller's message was empowered. Now the empowerment of the third angel's message, we all know this, brothers and sisters, Don't this, I, have, I may have put too much... Too many cookies on the shelf for you to be digesting all of this right now, but this, where we're at is not that simple, so, so don't disengage. Stay with me on this. We all know when the third angel's message is empowered. When is it empowered? Prophetically, it's empowered when the fourth angel joins it, correct? And the fourth angel of Revelation 18 is what? It's a mighty angel that comes down out of heaven, right? Is that right? And what happens? The earth is lightened with his glory. One of the characteristics of this mighty angel that comes down in Revelation 18 and joins the third angel's message and empowers the third angel's message is that the earth is lightened with his glory. And sure enough, when the angel of Revelation 10 came down and empowered the first angel's message, the message was carried to where? To every mission station in the world. So the characteristic of this angel's coming down is the same as this angel. The first angel's message was empowered, but we're running parallel with it. We're running what follows the first and second angel's message parallel with what follows, okay? Uh, if you understand that the... Revelation 18 is two parts. If you understand that the angels represent the work of God, then you don't have a problem saying that Revelation 18 is the loud cry message in a general sense. It's describing the work of God and the work of the people of God. But if you're going to get technical to it, you'll see that there are technical with it. You'll see that there's two steps in Revelation 18. Verses 1 through 3, the first angel comes down, earth is lightened with his glory. But then in verse 4, there is another voice where we are told the message goes, come out of her, my people. And technically, it's this other voice that is the loud cry. Um, in Selected Messages, book 2, page 118, Sister White says this, Oh, time is slipping away. The second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. This is one place where you can see that Sister White is telling us that technically the loud cry is verse 4. Okay, just hang with me. There's one more argument to bring to that. Signs of the Times, November 8th, 1899. There are two Christians in every church not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they have had light and seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth, enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn man against the worst of worship of the beast in the image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Brothers and sisters, technically, the loud cry begins at the Sunday law in the United States. And when Sister White's 
referring us to the loud cry. It's the other voice of verse 4. My point is this. Revelation 18, the fourth angel's message, the third angel's message, joining by the fourth angel's message, is to run parallel with the history of the Millerites. And the history of the Millerites tells us that the first angel's message was proclaimed and then empowered. Then the second angel's message comes, and it's in the second angel's message time period in this history where the Spirit is poured out without measure. And it's at the Sunday law in the United States that the loud cry begins to go forth in a powerful way to the world. And at the conclusion of the second angel's message, the door was closed in the parable of the ten virgins. The door was closed into the holy place. The door was closed in fulfillment with Revelation 3. And the loud cry message continues to go through history until Michael stands up in Daniel 12.1 and the door closes here, just as it closed here. We're going to read you some quotes in the next presentation where, Sister, we are familiar with this one, that the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. But Sister White tells us the second angel's message was fulfilled where? In the United States. First angel's message had an, a world impact. Second angel's message had an impact in the United States. And when this angel comes down and joins the third angel's message, the whole earth is lightened with his glory. This is Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3. But the loud cry of the third angel's message begins at the United States, paralleling this here. And it's at this point that the Spirit is poured out without measure, just as it was poured out in the midnight cry time period. The midnight cry time period is prefiguring the loud cry time period. And what we're suggesting as we run out of time here, but we have, we're doing good on time, by the way, is that before the Sunday law in the United States, there is an event that is worldwide in nature that parallels this event. And of course, you already know what we're suggesting is that prior to the Sunday Law, just as the four great powers of Europe came together to decide the fate of Islam, that prior to the Sunday Law in the United States, the world is going to come together to decide the fate of Islam. And that event took place on 9-11-2001. And at that point, based upon this history, the latter rain began to sprinkle. And the reason I'm saying sprinkle is because at this point, the wheat and tares are still together. And that's why Sister White says the latter rain will be falling on hearts all around them, but they will not receive or recognize it because they're still together. But at the Sunday law, the Seventh-day Adventist church is purified, and then the Spirit is poured out without measure. And we'll deal with this more when we come back. But the latter rain is falling. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we wish to understand intelligently the times in which we're living. For we've been told that we're to pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. Which implies that we must understand where we are in order to raise that prayer. Lord, we wish to receive the latter rain, and we know that you've told us that only those of us that are receiving the early rain will partake of the latter rain. And you further told us that the early rain is to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. And there's some of us that haven't been doing that, but we're understanding that through your prophetic word, you're awakening us to that responsibility. So we ask that you'd give us the wisdom and willingness to participate in the work of perfecting holiness and the fear of the Lord, that we might be among those that begin to receive the rain that is falling now on planet Earth and be empowered to share this warning message with a dying world. I once again ask you to put a burden upon every heart here that's hearing this to go home and test these things, ask forgiveness for um, these big subjects that we're handling in such a, a fast, shallow way, 
but we trust that your Holy Spirit is guiding and directing, so we thank you for the work that you are doing here in Jesus' name. Amen.